Um, so if you look at the screen, the topic of the lesson today, or the, the title of the lesson rather, is Declares the Lord. Um, if you notice the two verses that we read, one, the um, opening that Mickey read, and then um, what Ken just read, is both of these end with the phrase, declares the Lord. It's a declaration from the Lord. And so I want to review kind of the two verses that were read and then um, talk about both of these and how we can apply them to our lives and, um, and the, the plan that the Lord has for our lives. So let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29 will be in verse um, 11. Many of you probably have this, um, have this verse highlighted in your Bible, or maybe you have it uh, hung up in, uh, in your house somewhere. It says, For I know the thoughts uh, that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of hope, to give you a future uh, and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Well, that's a very peaceful thought, knowing that the Lord... He's thinking of us and that um, he wants good for us. And then if you look in Isaiah chapter 55, what Ken just read um, for us. Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, or, nor are your ways my ways says the Lord. A lot of times, and I left the clicker, I always do this. Right there. Y'all didn't know I was going to be walking in through the pews and making sure you were awake. A lot of times we put ourselves in the driver's seat of our life, and uh, we, we, we put ourselves um, in the driver's seat instead of God, and and what ends up happening is we make decisions based off of things that we would personally want rather than what God would want. I think we've all been guilty of that. When we make big decisions in our life, we're thinking about our immediate personal gratification instead of the long term um, of what God would want us to choose. I want us to focus on these two verses that we just, um, that we just read says, the Lord's thoughts are not our thoughts, okay? His ways are not our ways. Sometimes what we think and want isn't what's best for us. It's not, um, it's not what's best. And, and I think a lot of times that creates tension um, within us because we want uh, to do what we want to do and we don't want to be told what we want to do and we have this... American um, attitude of, well, I'm an independent person and I can pull myself up by the bootstraps. And, um, and so whatever I say and whatever I think is best is going to be the best. In reality, uh, that's, that's not what the Lord is saying. He's saying, look, you're going to have to trust me in some circumstances. Right? But my way is way better than your way. And my thoughts are way better than your thoughts. And I want us to look at two stories today that's going to kind of outline like, like, why in the world did the Lord decide to, to tell these people to go in a certain direction instead of the obvious of what us as humans would, would think about? Genesis chapter 12. When you look at Genesis chapter 12, you read uh, verses 1 through 4. If you'll flip over there with me. This is the call of Abraham. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your kindred, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curse you. And in, uh, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot with, went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. All right, so you've got Abraham here. He's 75 years old. He is rooted in his homeland, something he's always, somewhere he's always been, where his family's at, where all his property, all his possessions, all his materials, uh, um, material value in life, all of it's right here. His family, 
He is rooted. He's 75 years old. Now, Mickey, how long have you been in Russellville? 45 years. All right. Now, I know you're not near as old. You're not even close to 75. But, but let's pretend that the Lord said, Mickey, I want you to uproot right now, and I'm going to send you far away to a land, and I'm not going to tell you at first where I'm sending you. You're just going to have to trust me. But, you know, no more. You're not going to work at the vet's office anymore. You're going to have to sell that house out there with your land. And, and we're going to uproot you, and we're going to send you somewhere far off. And you think to yourself, I mean, Abraham, 75 years old, really? Why did the Lord not call him when he was 25 or, tw- or 30 or 35? It's a question that we have. But, you know, the Lord's thoughts aren't our thoughts. His ways aren't our ways. You know, at 75, this is the, that's the time where you, you kick back. You know, you get in that recliner. It's time for Westerns all day. Westerns. True grit. Grit TV, you know. It's time for you to, you know, get your... Get your checks, get your social security checks. That's the time when you take it easy and you go, you golf and you go to Jack's at five in the morning. All right, that is that is your time. The Lord said, No, no, Abraham. It's not your time to do that. I want you to uproot. I've got a mission for you. He listened and he embarked on that mission. And he listened to the Lord. As uh, as Americans, as as people that think uh, like human, in our human minds, we can't comprehend this. That's not the way that the narrative would have ended for us. But again, our ways are not the Lord's ways. I want us to look at a second story in Genesis chapter 21, beginning in verse 9. So Abraham has had a son named Ishmael by Sarah's uh, servant Hagar. And then Sarah has a son named Isaac. And so, as you can expect, you, you know, guys, if you've ever tried this, if you ever had tried, if you ever tried having two girlfriends, you know, they don't really like each other much, you know. Um, not a good idea. So there's obviously some tension here between uh, Sarah and Hagar. And as you read, before we uh, begin reading, you read about how um, Sarah is just done with Hagar and done with Ishmael. And I want us to read the story and what Abraham does and what, do, what God does. Um, and kind of the, the you know, not, not what we would view God as, as, as choosing to do in this situation. So chapter 21, beginning in verse 9, it says, And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian woman, whom she had borne to Abraham, scoffing. Some versions say mocking her. Therefore she said to Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman. And her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. Abraham loved his son, Ishmael. But Sarah, Sarah's his wife. And she says, I want you to get rid of your son and his mother. So Abraham is is, is very stressed. He doesn't know what to do, you know. His wife is very dead set on getting rid of his, his son and Hagar, and he's torn between this. What, what is he going to do? God comes to Abraham and says, verse 12, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he is your seed. What? Wait! Sarah's angry and, and, and just maybe out of, a, you know, out of anger says, get rid of Ishmael, get rid of Hagar, send them out. And you think, well, maybe, maybe just let her, give her time to calm down. Or, or maybe the Lord will say, you know, no, let's just let's do something. The Lord says, listen to her, send them out. I don't understand why he would say that, but we're going to keep reading and we're going, to, we're going to find out. So Abraham, verse 14, So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and putting it on her shoulder, he gave it to, uh, 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 and gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away when she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water and the skin was used up. She placed the boy under one of the shrubs 
Then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot. For she said to herself, Let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite of him, lifted up her voice, and wept. So Abraham got some water, a case of water, got some bread, and sent out his son who he loved and the, and the mother into the wilderness and didn't see him again. It says that they were at the point, they're out of water, they're out of bread, they're about to die. And you're thinking, well, how can God choose this? That was his choice. God chose that, no, Abraham, listen, send them out. Send them out into the wilderness. We're going to read what God does further. You keep reading. Verse 15, or 16. Then she, then she went and sat across from him at a distance, at a bow shot. For she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. She sat opposite of him and lifted up her voice and wept. Verse 17, And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him with your hand. I will make him a great nation. So God still has a promise for Ishmael. He's going to make him a great nation. It says, Lift up the boy. Verse 19, And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. Then she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad to drink. The Lord provided. He sent him out into the wilderness said, Now go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. He provided a well of water. Verse 20, So God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. So, so he sent him out in the wilderness. He says, I'm going to make Ishmael a great nation as well. Well, in our minds, we're thinking, maybe he'll go through the same, the same, about it the same way he did with Isaac. Maybe he'll take him to a land where, where, where Ishmael can, can reproduce and, and grow the kingdom and, and, and grow his nation. Now he says, you're going to prosper with what you have. You're going to prosper where you're at. Prosper in the wilderness. That doesn't make any sense to us in our human minds. We think of God as this person that is, if he says, oh, I'm going to make a great nation out of you, he's going to throw up the mansions and, and, and have a cakewalk. Uh, it's going to be a cakewalk to the mansion and to the land. And the, and the, and the, that's not the way that God is working here because his thoughts are not our thoughts and his, his plans aren't our plans. The moral of the story is the Lord's plans might be different from your plans. So all of that was the introduction. So we've got to speed it up. Um, the Lord's plans might be different from your plans. Well, in what ways? Regarding where you work. I don't know if you can see that. But if you're, doing it, if you're doing the outline, the Lord's plans might be different from your plans regarding where you work. I work with this lady, um, and we teach seventh grade. And you can, you can ask Jessica, that is the bottom of the barrel in terms of jobs. Uh, seventh grade, if you're a seventh grade teacher, okay, it don't get worse, does it? You think, I, you think I'm joking? Some of y'all are laughing. I'm being serious. I have come to the edge, okay? Seventh grade, and I was, I was talking to uh, one of the teachers in our quad, and I, I, I looked at her because she's only been a teacher a few years. But I said, why did you choose teaching? She said, well, I ask myself that every day. Um, she said, actually, it's funny. The job I was at before, I was managing you know, some things. I made four times as much as I made as a teacher. And I looked at her, and I was just like, what is wrong with you? You would come to work with 7th grade kids. Sorry about that, Layla, I'm sorry. You know, seventh grade. Some of them are sweet, like Layla. Um, you would come to work with 7th graders making a quarter of the money when you had that job where you could... And she said, well, I did it because I thought I could do more for the Lord doing this than what I was doing there. And man, that opened my eyes. What a noble, noble thing. Uh, sometimes... The Lord has different plans for you regarding where you're going to work, what your ministry is going to be where you work. Maybe you're at a job that makes more money now. Um, 
Maybe you're at a job that is more comfortable, but you're not, you don't have as many opportunities to minister or, or to evangelize. Or, or maybe there's a need over here that the Lord really needs you in this spot. Those are some things we need to think about. We see dollars and cents a lot of times. But at the end of the day, the Lord is, is going to lead us um, if we let Him and we follow His Word and His Scriptures, lead us where we need to be in regards to um, work. I saw this uh, post on Facebook, and it's been reposted several times. Um, it said, wisdom is, no, is, wisdom is when you would rather be at every one of your child's events in a three or $4,000 car than to only be at one of them occasionally in an $80,000 car. And then it, it went on to say, wisdom is you would rather uh, live in a small, modest home, but be home with your kids every night, than uh, live in a big old mansion um, and, and let the government raise your kids you know, I, I thought that was really insightful. And, you know, it's easy for me to say because I don't got no money, so I can... Say, yeah, that's right. Amen to that. Uh, I got that 5,000 car. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, right? Um, but sometimes what we think is best and what we want, what we desire, that's not, that's not the plan the Lord has for us. He's got a different plan. What about the Lord has different plans for you regarding... Where you live, I'm going to tell you, okay, in this fairy tale story, in this wonderful, you know, now that I'm here, I'm in Russellville, the fairy tale has ended great. But when Trey drove me up to Russellville the first time when I was here, my thought was, because I, I was in Decatur, going to hunts all the time, I was like, what in the world have I gotten myself into? We were driving down, and, and I, was, I was seeing a, a rest. And I know now, now Russell's a big city to me, but, but, but when I first got here, I'm driving, driving down 43, and I'm like, this is the boonies. This place, is there anywhere to eat? I mean, is there a gas station around here? And I, I was very unsure. Uh, and I kind of had taken the job out of a... a you know, just could Trey kind of reached out, and I was like, man, this summer is just going to be a waste. I'm going to just be miserable the whole summer. They got me out in this cabin with no Wi-Fi, no service. Uh, um, you know, it's going to be a rough, rough summer. And, you know, that decision to come to Russell has given me the greatest blessings of my entire life other than finding the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a beautiful wife. Uh, beautiful kids, beautiful mother-in-law, you know. So the Lord had plans for me that I didn't know, and I wasn't trusting at first, and I had a bad attitude, and I thought I was going to be miserable. But, you know, I met Doug, and that changed, man, you know. Lord may have different plans for you regarding who you date, who you marry, Young fellas, you may be thinking, well, this is this is the, the person that this is the person that I want to date, you know. This this girl who just is so beautiful and she, you know, she made girls who you date. You know, I, th I think Annabeth, she thought that that um oh wait, whoops. She was gonna get that. <laughs> she thought she was gonna get that. She got something better than that. She got that. <laughs> The Lord has plans. Let's get, let's get off the cowboy and the. All right, there, let's go back here. Yeah, nobody needs to see that. Right, lower your expectations, ladies. This is what you're getting. You ain't getting that cowboy. So, but in, in all in all seriousness, the Lord may, the Lord may have other plans for who you date and marry. Who you think is going to be your forever. The Lord may say, Nah, I know you are sure. That's not your forever when it comes to that. I mean, I think a lot of us adults that are married now can think of, I'm so glad the Lord didn't let me marry that person. And I'm so glad I married the person who I married. The Lord has, His ways and His thoughts are higher than ours. We have to trust in that. 
What about where you go to college? Oh, goodness gracious. Let's get past there. The Lord's plans might be different from your plans regarding where you go to college. You know, I, um, per, you know I'm just talking personal stories here, but, you know, I thought I was going to go to college. I was going to play tennis down by the beach, you know, go to the beach every day and, you know, and I ended up staying home and commuting, and that worked out great. And then the Lord opened up an opportunity for me to go to a Christian school, um, Freed Hardeman University, and I, that, that wasn't, I would have liked to, but that wasn't in the cards for me financially. He opened the door. I was able to go to a Christian school. Young people in here who are about to go to college, maybe what you're thinking in terms of college, maybe something changes. Maybe it's for the better. I'll, I'll use this opportunity right here to, to harp on how awesome Christian colleges are um, and being in that environment all, all the time and going to chapel every day. Maybe that's what the Lord has plans for you. And that was never on your radar. But even if the Lord's plan is for you to go to a public university, you can flourish wherever you're at. There's wonderful Christian student centers at the public universities. But, but, but my point is, the Lord may have plans for you. Why don't you do what you think is best in terms of your spirituality instead of what you want to do? Um, very important. What about the Lord may have different plans from you, uh, for you regarding how you raise your family? Oh, your friends. We'll, we'll go to friends first. Your friends. You know, I've lost uh, great friends before. They move off. Friends are coming and going. And I've had some lifelong friends. You know, maybe you think that the, the friends that you have now that, you know, or you've lost, you've lost a friend and you think the world is over or that maybe it worked out for the better for both of you. It, are you surrounding yourself with the friends that you're supposed to fr surround yourself with? Then finally, are you... The Lord's plans might be different from your plans regarding how you raise your kids. And this is something that I think about all the time and I, I struggle with even though I've got two little ones, is am I trying to raise my kids based on the world standards, or am I saying, I, I'm going to raise my kids based off of the Bible standards? I think that's a, a reality check for most of us because I'm already trying to, I mean, I've already got Gray doing quarterback drills in the house. He's lefty. You know, I got him throwing off the mound already at two years old. You know, am I raising my, am I raising my kids to get a scholarship and be a ball player, to be a great ball player and, 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 and get a scholarship? And that, that's okay. But if that's my whole entire goal, Maybe it's not okay. Or, or am I raising my kids to get everything they want or to be the most popular or to always have to be entertained? Maybe we need to change our views on how we raise our family. We talked about in our class this morning, Deuteronomy chapter 6, how your family atmosphere at home should be Deuteronomy chapter 6. If the, the first time a verse has been said or if the only time a verse is quoted is at church, that's a really bad thing, guys. Or if the only prayer that your kids hear is at church, that's a really bad thing. Deuteronomy chapter 6, it tells us all day, every day, you should be teaching your kids about the Lord. All day, every day, you're applying what you're doing in your life to principles found in the Bible. Are you raising your kids based off of your plans or based off of the Lord's plans. You know, I, um, a lot of times we only view how God's plan affects us. You know, my grandfather passed away two or three months ago, and we prayed, I prayed, that he would be healed every single day. And my dad prayed, and my family prayed, and we all prayed that he would be healed and he would get to stay with us. And my dad was doing a sermon a week or two ago, and he said, but you know what? Our prayer wasn't, we didn't get the answer we wanted. He said, because I think, he said, I think my grandfather 
was praying the opposite. I think he was praying for the Lord to take him home. We only view how things are going to affect us. And the Lord's plans, they have to involve everybody. So when you think, oh, the Lord didn't work it out for me in the exact way that I wanted it right here and then, look at the bigger picture. It's how it's going to affect everybody. It's going to, how it's going to affect the church. And maybe because you don't get your way right now, maybe it's going to bring lots of people to, to Christ that wouldn't have otherwise been brought to Christ. You never know. We have to trust the Lord's plans. How do I know that I'm following the Lord's plans for my life? And, and man, I'm, I'm long-winded. Jeremiah 29, we're going back to what we were talking about. If you search the Lord, and you read verse 13 and 14, if you search the Lord with all your heart, the Lord is going to lay out His plans for your life. If you search the Lord with all your heart, it says you're going to find Him. Verse 14, you will, you will be rescued from that spiritual captivity. I saw this on Facebook and nine. Y'all can't see it, but I'll, just trust me. Just, I'll read it to you. I, I thought this was, really, this was really good. Somebody may have posted it in here. I don't know. Five things that Jesus did not say. Okay. Follow your heart. Rather, he said, follow me. So you want to make sure that your plans are the Lord's plans? Let's, let's, let's not do that whole follow your heart thing. Let's follow what Jesus said. You want to make sure your plans are matched up with the Lord's plans? It's not be true to yourself. <laughs> Jesus never said be true to yourself. He said whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself. So be the opposite of yourself. That's what Jesus says. <laughs> we say, I just got to be me. <laughs> no, please don't be you. Right? This world would not be good if you were you. Be who Christ would have you to be. Believe in yourself. You know? Jesus said, believe in me. Believe in Christ. Live your truth. Your truth, my truth. Uh-uh. Jesus said, I am the truth. Do what you want as long as you are happy. No. Jesus says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? You see... These are phrases that the world says is okay, that the world says, you can do whatever you want to do. It's you, you are in charge of your plans. That's not, that's not biblical, guys. The Lord should be in charge of your decision-making in your life. And I see some of y'all dozing off, so we're going to get going. We're going to get going. I encourage you, uh, read through these verses, based on, uh, um, and they will outline the Lord's plans for your life. Take a picture of these if you want to right now. Go back and read these verses. We're running out of time. But the gist is, is this. If we seek the Lord and we're actively praying and trying to get answers from the Lord through His Word, that's how we know the plan, our plans are going to be His plans. And so I encourage you to do that. In conclusion... If you allow the Lord to move your life in the direction of Him, your life will reflect Psalm 112. Read Psalm 112 if you get the chance. Um, it, 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 we're in church. Let's just go ahead and read it. Psalm 112. Psalm 112, praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be everlasting, in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid 
until he sees his desire upon his enemies. He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. He, his righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted with honor. The wicked will see it and be grieved. He will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. All these things that it says of what a good life looks like, if you seek the Lord and you allow the Lord to move your life in the direction of, of, of His way, your life will reflect Psalm 112. And so those are some things that I had kind of been studying and some things that I had been looking at, and I thought I would share them with you. Today, if you are in need of prayers of the congregation, if maybe it's, it's the case that you have given your life to Christ before and you've, you, now you've kind of fallen away and you've fallen off the path and you're ready to rededicate your life, confess your sins, rededicate your life, um, or maybe it's the case that you need to start your life with Christ. Um, maybe you've heard the word and you, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and, and uh, you're ready to change your life and repent and, and you're, you're going to confess your sins and confess His name and, and, and you want to be baptized today to start your walk with Christ. Whatever you need, we pray, do not leave this building without your need being met. Please come as we stand and as we sing.